Welcome to This Day Live, the Sunday talk show where we discuss all things political, bringing you the top stories locally, nationally, and from around the world. I'm Ruben Abati, and This Day Live begins now. I'd like to welcome today's panelists. Uh, first, Professor Bola Kintenowa, Director General of the Bulitak Center for International Diplomacy and Strategic Studies. Yemi Adamolekun, the Executive Director, Enough is Enough. And of course, uh, Ayo Teriba, CEO, Economic Associate. Now, we start here in Nigeria, where the Senate has finally passed the 2018 appropriation bill of about 9.12 trillion for the 2018 fiscal year. Six months after President Muhammad Buhari presented the draft copy of the 8.612 trillion Naira 2018 budget estimates to a joint session of the National Assembly. This was on the 7th of November last year. The National Assembly, in considering it, has jacked it up by about 508 billion. For six months, the 2018 budget estimates spent in the National Assembly became the longest period for the consideration of appropriation bills so far since the year 2000, when a full-fledged yearly budget was first presented to it. It will be recalled that President Muhammad Buhari, who was worried about the non-passage of the 2018 appropriation bill in March this year, met with the leadership of both the Senate and the House of Representatives to strike a deal on how both arms of government will work in synergy to see the to see to the quick and possible passage of the budget in the overall interest of the country. But as has happened in 2016 and 2017, the 2018 budget has also been delayed. Tereba, you are the economist. Um, what's your take? Every year, you know, since uh, 2016, the budget gets delayed. It becomes a matter of controversy and politics. How do you assess this latest development? six months after the uh, first presentation of the budget. Right, well, we have to first of all say that they eventually passed it. Um, it's better late than never. But this has been a problem, not just of the current assembly, not a problem since 2016, it's been a problem since 1999, since we transited to, to democracy. Before 1999, budgets are announced on the 31st of December. You never had a situation where you entered the new year and there was no budget. Um, so, and there's no reason why it should be different under a democracy. Um, we had in the past called for a budget process law, you know, that stipulates when the executive should propose and stipulates when the uh, legislature must have passed it. Um, where there is no law, the reality is that there is no sin. So there's no law that says the National Assembly cannot pass the budget eight months into the year. So if we want to be serious about this, as no, Nigeria... No, what the Constitution says is that you have a window of about six months during which you can rely on the previous estimate. So you can't take eight months. Follow the example of countries that managed to get it right. America, the U.S. has a budget process law which means you can't take it for granted. You can't, you know, count on the legislature to do it when there are no strict. You know, that would be my suggestion. Um, it's not good for us to wait every year for one quarter of the year, five months into the year before you pass a budget. We should pass it before the year starts. But, I mean, I'll spend a little time with you on this since uh, you are the expert in this area. Um, now that the... Uh, Senate has passed it and the uh, House of Rights has passed it. You know, there is no guarantee that the budget will come out. I, many Nigerians are afraid that this year we probably may not have a budget. Why? Because first, the two uh, chambers will have to reconcile, harmonize, before they take it to the president. In 2016, 2017, there was big controversy and delay between the executive and the legislature over the uh, budget. Now this is May. You see any possibility of the process being taken care of quickly, or we, we could be here until September and there will be no budget? 
What do you think? Well, the expectation is that once the National Assembly managed to pass it, it's not likely that the president is going to delay in giving his assent to it. Although you see that uh, the National Assembly has added uh, more than half a trillion naira to the estimate suggested by the, so it's all going to revolve around whether the uh, president is satisfied with the additions, because that could become a bone of contention. Well, but the Senate is claiming that they, they had consulted the executive before they added so let's hope the that, half uh, a trillion. In the absence of disagreement, estimates. it should soon be signed. Yeah, but there are also some other gray areas in that uh, uh, budget. Um, the issue of subsidy has not been addressed because the uh, Senate, the National Assembly, let me say, you know, is protesting that, you know, certain departments of government, particularly the NMPC, yeah, have been taking money, uh, government money, uh, that is not budgeted for. There's also the issue of the 12 Toscano jets bought from the United, United States, States that has not been appropriated for. Do you think this will generate some controversy? Oh, well, the Senate has approved a bill. So we have gone beyond controversy. Oh. Since, since they now have something that they have passed. No, no, well, no. Controversy, I mean, okay. controversy is prior to passage. So if they have a passage and the only discrepancy is just half a billion, I don't think we should read. No, it's not even more half subsidies. a billion. It's more yeah. than half that. A trillion, yeah. No, it's, it's even more than half a trillion. But Yemi, let me come to you. You work in the area of transparency and you've been saying enough is enough. <laughs> Nigeria cannot be run on an ad hoc basis. What's your reaction? I think, I mean, Mr. Teriba's comment that controversy can be prior, actually, it's quite humorous, if I want to use that word. So there's that element of it in terms of how long it took them to pass the budget and the politics therein. But the comments um, Mr. Abati raised are quite valid. We have an issue where we're technically, for the sake of an argument, paying for a subsidy. That's not appropriated for. So NNPC basically pays the subsidy and then returns the remits to the Federation account what it feels it's left. And in the last six months, by NNPC's own admission, we've gone from consuming about 20 million litres a day to 60 million litres a day. Um, there's no, if I'm not mistaken, appropriation for elections. We have the budget. So you have a budget for starting in June, possibly, for the second half of the year that chooses to ignore key elements of what a country is already spending money on. And I, I, how we think that that is acceptable baffles me. I'm actually looking forward to the um, civil society organizations and the analysis of the budget, because every year we go through the process of looking at what is frivolous and, and, and the things that are not necessary, buying the same things year in, year out. Another thing that I think is very interesting, at least from our perspective, is over a seven-year period, we advocated for the National Assembly itself to have a budget, because it doesn't. It's a first-line charge, and they get paid regardless of what's happening in the country. For the first time in seven years last year, um, they did make their budget public. It was 125 billion naira. Civil society organizations and citizens got together, hacked the budget, and said they don't need more than 55 billion. This year, they haven't released their budget. And they did that last year before the federal budget. This year, they haven't done that. So there, there are quite a number of issues to, to be con controversial. Well, Prof, let me come to you. I mean, you were part of this budgeting process, I believe, as Director General of the Nigeria Institute of International Affairs. What do you think is really wrong? Every year, same stuff. Same problems. Many things are wrong. First of all, when we talk about delay, we do not have, uh, as um, I probably pointed uh, to indirectly, a law regulating the process. You know, before the fiscal year, right, is uh, April to March. That's what the paper still says. Now, budget itself is just to guide mm. whether from January to December, April to March, there is any budget passed. Look, there will still be, you know, uh, financial transactions. The, the issue is this. First, there is the problem of padding, all right, in budgeting. The current 
National Assembly wants to put an end to quote and unquote, to borrow your words, this uh, frivolous, you know, um, issues. Now, who is supposed to have a budget? Who is budgeting for who? This is another area of misunderstanding. For instance, the executive arm of government is claiming, you know, the authority over what it has presented. The National Assembly is saying, yes, you can come up, but they have the right to review, to subtract, and to add to it. Right. These are some of the issues. Now, the, the government itself had to make it open, declare to the Nigerian um, MDs, I mean the, the ministries, the departments, departments and, agencies. and agencies, that they must all submit their budgets, they should defend their budgets, they should promptly go to the National Assembly. That used to be a delay in the past too. Now, many people are saying this should not really constitute a major problem if the executive arm of government is strict and serious about budgeting. Compel your MDAs, let them submit this. Anyway, so I, I think the point Prof is making is about greater synergy. Hmm. Um, we'll take a short break. When we come back, we'll spend a little time again on this budgeting thing before we take on the uh, next subject, which is about, you know, uh, partisan politics. Because I think there are still a number of issues we can look at. The priorities in the budget, for example, the emphasis, uh, the weighting of the budget uh, between capital expenditure and uh, recurrent expenditure. But we won't spend too much time on that, but it will be nice to take a look at it. It's time now for a break here on This Day Live, the Sunday talk show. When we return, we'll be discussing the APC World Congresses. Don't go away. Welcome back to This Day Live, the Sunday talk show here on the Arise News Channel. Now, before we uh, went on break, uh, I was saying, you know, we'll wrap up the discussion on the uh, budgeting process. Now, Terry, but I'll come back to you. When you look at the uh, budget estimates, again, same problem every year. The capital expenditure is lower than the recurrent expenditure, okay? And this is June. What is the prospect that anything under uh, capital expenditure uh, can be achieved, particularly as the budget, as it is, as proposed, prioritizes uh, power, works, housing, uh, prioritizes the Ministry of Interior, that's Boko Haram, more defense, or less, yeah. uh, prioritizes uh, defense, and then education came, comes at uh, the fourth position. And the big thing on that education that has been proposed is the uh, building of okay. 12 new universities. I mean, do we need 12 new universities? So in, in terms of priorities, you see that there's even a problem with that budget that Nigerians, be, they raise a lot of questions about. What do you think? Quickly. Right. Um, if we are discussing a budget that is you know, less than 10% of GDP, uh, in a country where you need a budget that is at least 25% of GDP, then a lot of things have already been rationed out. The real problem is that whereas uh, the private sector in Nigeria knows how to make money, the GDP is now 117, 115 trillion naira, and government could hardly raise 7 trillion naira in revenue. So government has to learn how to raise revenue in an economy that is obviously buoyant. So until you solve the revenue problem, you will forever be arguing about uh, why not recurrent over capital expenditure. Yeah, because you talk about salaries must be paid, overheads must be paid. It's when you manage to find revenue to cover those that you can free resources for yeah, capital. Yeah, but a fifth of that budget has proposed is even dedicated to service index. Yes. That's right. Indeed. That's one. Two, yes. you know, the benchmark is uh, $51 or $50 at 2.3 million barrels per day. And oil now, you know, the spot price is about 
80 dollars. Yeah. So if you look at the metrics of the of the budgeting even, process even itself, budgeted at 75 dollars. Yeah. Oil is less than 10 percent of the economy. That's how Nigeria boxed herself into a corner. Mm by referencing the economy, by referencing government revenue to oil. And indexing wages. You have more than 100 million non-LGDP. So Nigeria needs to look for a way of making money out of the bulk, not making money out of the shrinking component, which is oil. Mm. So until we solve the revenue problem, whether you're saying we don't have enough to spend on capital or we spend most on debt service, those are reflections of low, low revenue. Once priorities. you have sufficient revenue, which for now, the federal government shouldn't be speaking about a budget of less than 15 trillion naira. And the states maybe will be spending the balance of 10 to 15 no trillion states and LGs until you find such revenue. I think what Ruben is drawing your attention to, prioritization. Hmm. Revenue, if you have 10 naira as revenue for the whole year, what do you want to spend the 10 naira on? on. For instance, uh, capital projects, all these things. But that doesn't mean much. It's only good for the paper. In most cases, approvals are given for projects, but there is no financial backing. And at the end of the day, uh, the extent to, in fact, what's the percentage of execution of uh, the budget? Yeah, or yeah. what you call budget performance. budget performance. So now education is education not as important as security. Mm -hmm. I think that the point is raising. You know, when we are looking at the question of prioritization in, in budgeting process, all right, should it be uh, Boko Haram driven insecurity that should be giving more money? Should it be defense? Should it be the establishment of new universities? In light of, now we now have an, uh, probably an imminent uh, Ebola uh, uh, epidemic. No. We hope no, not. I know. <laughs> no, it's, it's imminent now because already we are checking, you know. Anyway, I, 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 think, I think the point, think the point about valid, prioritization yeah. has been well made because there are people who even say, oh, health should even be prioritized. Yeah. Yes. And so that's why Prof is probably person. talking about Ebola. But let's look at uh, what has been happening on the political scene. Uh, yesterday, uh, the uh, All Progressives uh, uh, Congress, the ruling party, held uh, uh, congresses, and there were parallel congresses everywhere. The crisis in the ruling All Progressives uh, Congress, APC, showed no sign clearly of receding, as violence marred the state congresses of the party held on Saturday nationwide with 10 states hosting parallel congresses. The states where factions of the party worked at cross purposes were Lagos, Quara, Delta, Rivers, Ondo, Enugu, Kogi, Bayesa, Oyo, and Eboni. However, APC has said any congress not conducted by the committee appointed by the party is illegal, and whatever result it has generated is null and void. Speaking with reference to the controversies being generated by the conduct of parallel con congresses, by agreed stakeholders in some states during the Congress. The National Publicity Secretary of the party, Bolaji Abdullahi, said as far as the APC was concerned, there was nothing like parallel Congress. The National Executive Committee of the party had foreseen the trend of parallel voting and attempted to prevent it by extending for one year the tenure of his members from the world to the national level. But an uprising against the move forced President Muhammad Buhari to compel the uh, National Executive Committee to share the idea and conduct elective congresses. However, it's been like a tower of Babel since the exercise started from the world three weeks ago, through the local governments last week and the states on Saturday. Now, Prof, I'll start with you. What does this mean for the integrity of the democratic process? Even in states where there were no parallel congresses, uh, maybe the congress did not even take place, or some factions boycotted, and it's in all the 36 states, not just in 10. It may be in 10, you know, uh, parallel congresses, but in every, every state of the Federation, the APC issue. showed a lack of capacity to organize itself internally. Well, I wouldn't say it's a problem of uh, incapacity to organize. 
but that of insincerity of purpose. Mm. Nigeria has always been in turmoil, in problem, since time of independence. Why? Because we refuse to predicate governance on honesty of purpose, on fairness, on justice. So what uh, has transpired with uh, the APC Congresses is clear. People are saying, look, and I can borrow from Yemi this time, enough <laughs> is enough. <laughs> now, I like that. You can, That's good publicity. You can begin to uh, fool some people. All right? You can deceive them from morning till afternoon, even till evening time. But by the time they go back to their room and sleep and come back, they will come back and protest. Enough is really enough because at the end of the day, the organization of parallel uh, congresses is to suggest to say, no, please, we are fed up with your leadership. Mm. It's as simple as that. And um, for instance, I, I read uh, the reports by the APC um, NEC saying that um, the court did not serve them in Abuja. You know, there were people in, um, in the East, in the Niger, um, Niger Delta, right. all of them now saying, look, um, they, they oppose the, the holding of the Congress is there, right? Now they got uh, a service from the court, and the leadership, national leadership, is now saying, no, they should have been served. But they still sent a lawyer to the court to, to quickly answer. In other words, it is an APC already divided against itself. And they are now trying to push forward in a manual military fashion, trying to use force, coerce um, you know, people into doing that. It can't work. And I think that already uh, this is not a wall of Jericho. At all. Well, That's you mean, I mean, uh, Prof has been uh, referencing your organization. Uh, look, I read uh, an interview by Moise Banere, mm. who is legal advisor of the APC, and he made more or less the same point uh, made by the uh, publicity secretary, Bola Yadulai, saying that, look, they have to follow the laws of the party, the constitution of the party, that this is about the rule of law. But the problem within the APC is that there are too many godfathers, mm. as he put it. This was an interview, I think, in the Nigerian Tribune. And he, he was asked questions about Lagos in particular, where you would think that, look, some people are in charge in Lagos. But even in Lagos, two factions emerged mm -hmm. yesterday. So what really is the, is the problem? Is it, is it just about insincerity of purpose or the threat of a party that has too many uh, chefs in the uh, kitchen? I think maybe a combination of both, really. Um, and if you backdrop about a week ago, when the people who defected from the PDP gave the party notice that within seven yes. days they have issues, issues to grind, so to speak, and in responding, Erufai's initial response, well, part A of his response was that, well, even if you go, Buhari will still win. However, I agree with you that there are issues that should be addressed. And I think for me, at least that level of honesty speaks volumes. Um, the problem with our political parties, not the, I mean, one of the key problems with our political parties is internal democracy. And that's why when primaries are conducted, it's a big song and dance to have a primary process that doesn't have any violence, that you actually have a clear process where people voted, their votes were counted. So in the context of that, and when people are um, pushing back against imposition, pushing back against people who are old, in Lagos, for example, um, Senator Tunbu had said if you had been in office for three terms, step down for some other people to come in. When you have a situation where within the party, what's happening at the state level is different from the agenda at the, at the national level. So when you have those conflicting yeah, purposes... Yeah, should, should one individual be the one to dictate exactly. what must be done? Precisely. And, and if it's built on consensus, there, there shouldn't be any problem. Precisely. So it's, if a you forced, have, it's a forced consensus. Well, you can't force that. That's the point. So if you, because you cannot force a consensus, well, at a point, your forced <laughs> consensus pushes back. And I think that's what we're really seeing. And what very significant is what you said is that it would be a difference if you said it's in 10 spots. And then you can analyze each state for its peculiarity and why there are cases. But if you're across the country, 
you have the leading party in the country unable to put its internal house in order, then it really makes you wonder what's in store for a general elections. Well, I'm terrible. I, I mean, all things considered, this is probably not an APC problem. I imagine that it's a problem with the political, political party parties. system and the level of our democracy in Nigeria. But what are the implications for the entire democratic project? It's too, it's too soon, it's too early to be analyzing implications. Um, the, our democracy, or any other democracy for that matter, rests on three pillars. On the party, on the parliament, and then the president. So it's the party, the legislature, and the executive, the president superintends over the civil service. What about the people? Is this your democracy model? Civil society. You vote. No, the people vote. How but you the have institutions. a democracy without people? You vote. You meet them at the general election, but you don't govern. It is the but party. But we govern through them. No, it is the, that is very established, you know, theory no. of, you know, democratic okay. transition. So the parties will produce the candidates, either for the legislature or for the presidency. And the periods of congresses or the periods of primaries are the periods when the party gets their say. Once elections are held, once candidates are elected, the parties go into the background. So look at what is happening. Um, two weeks ago, we were here, you know, uh, condemning the violence at the Ekiti primary. A week later, they resolved the matter without without violence, and they, had they reconciled them. So party. if you had well, I mean, problems... Well, there was violence uh, yesterday. I, in Imo State, the chairman so, so of, the, we had one of the factions was killed. Yeah. With and in Lagos, somebody was if killed. If you had a crisis in 10 out of 36 states yesterday, let's, do, let's see what the party is able to do a week down the road. No, I already in said it was in not in only in 10, in 10 states. states. Okay, it's in modern. 10 states, maybe there were parallel congresses, yeah. but in every but state, there were issue. issues. So, in the, that clear. if they are in the heat of it, before we say that the party lacks capacity, let's see how they're able to bring it under control. But we should see this as a very natural part of democratic transition. Prior to democracy, you settled it. No, post-election, post-election, you can talk about incapacity to control or yes. not control. Anyway, I think but before, but before the election, yes. all right, yes. we are talking about incapacity to organize a cohesive, a successful something. It's, well, too, I, it's too soon to well, I think, declare I that. I think what is, we what is interesting here, the party what is uh, uh, it important on here is that whatever problems emerge later in the political process, mm. they usually begin much, much earlier. earlier at the level of voter registration, yes. at the level of what Congress yes. is, and all of that Builds can become, program. you know, the signal of what will come, what come? in the future. Yep. But we should continue to monitor it because what is important the is the integrity the of the process the so that we can have excellent outcomes for, in the interest of the people. Mm -hmm. We'll take another break here on This Day Live, the <laughs> Sunday talk show. When we return, we'll be discussing the Nigerian Inspector General of Police, his saga with, his, with the Senate. Don't go away. Welcome back to This Day Live, the Sunday talk show here on the Arise News Channel. Nigeria's police boss, Ibrahim Idris, says the men elites do not owe any individual or group any apology in discharging their duties. He said this while responding to the resolution made by senators over his refusal to honor the invitation of the Senate. IGP Idris has refused to appear before the Senate on three different occasions. He had been summoned over the growing security in the country. And the case of Senator Dino Melaye, the senator representing Kogi West. The first time the Inspector General of Police was invited to appear before the senators, he accompanied President Muhammad Buhari to Boucher State, but sent representatives who were rejected by the lawmakers. Responding on Wednesday night, the IGP accused the lawmakers of attempting to witch hunt him, vying not to be intimidated. Interesting time with the current Inspector General of Police. He and the Senate seem to be, uh, you know, daggers okay. drawn uh, on so many issues. But, Yemi, you will start with this. You will recall that once upon a time in this country, uh, there was a case, I, I think that's the precedent in this matter, uh, Senate, uh, Tony, uh, Senate versus Tony Momo. Mm -hmm. 
uh, Tony Mama was editor of the Daily Times. Mm -hmm. He was some, uh, summoned by the uh, Senate, and he said the Senate had no right uh, to summon him or to inquire into how he does his work as uh, a journalist. Mm -hmm. And you know, of course, Lord Denny, uh, QC as he then was, already ruled on privileges of journalists. But can a senator, a, a, an inspector general of police, who is a public servant, who is under the uh, oversight, uh, you know, uh, framework of, uh, you know, legislative uh, bodies, can he really say he will not answer a summon by the Senate of the Federal Republic or the National Assembly? Or can he possibly send a representative and say that is adequate? Well, there are two things. The initial stage was him being someone to speak on uh, Mr. Melai, a senator representing Kogi West. And at least in my personal opinion, I think the Senate was wrong to want to play judge and jury in its own case. And what the IG of police did in that situation was send a representative and did not go. So you want the institution of the police to respond to questions, we will send you someone. The Senate refused to entertain the representative. Now, you fast forward a week or two. The Senate now decides to add the incessant killings across the country, and at that time, invite the Inspector General of Police again. And at this point, again, he refuses to honor that invitation. And at that point, I have a problem with it. And I have a problem with it fundamentally because as a Nigerian, and you look across the length and breadth of the country, there are incessant killings. It is the duty of those who've been elected to represent Nigerians to want to get, for the sake of argument, a situation report on what are you doing. Now, for, this, for the severity of the issues, i.e. Nigerian lives being lost, I think it is disrespectful of the idea of police to not think that that is worthy of his time to show up to explain, this is what is happening in this part of the country. This is what we're doing about it. This is what is happening. This is what we're doing about it. This is what we need. I might need to, even if you turn it into, I might need to recall, recall some of your, um, your guards because we need more police. And because Nigeria is under policed. We need more police on, on the ground. So for me, I think that's not even for the Senate particularly, but it's the people the Senate represent. Because the Senate represents, our senators representing Nigerians. So when Nigerians are dying, and your representatives wants you, as the chief law enforcer of the state, in a, of the country, in a sense, to explain that, and you don't think it's worth your while, I, th I think that, that is unacceptable, quite frankly. Prof, what do you think? I think the IGP is unnecessarily arrogant. Mm -hmm. And his arrogance does not have any justification, any at good all. basis. Look at it this way. When Mr. President, Muhammad Buhari himself told us that he gave him instructions instruction, yes. all right, to go to Benue State. And the same president came back to discover that... Three months later. Yes, that he had not complied. And uh, the next statement that will come from his office is that uh, he has not been given any summon, any query by Mr. President. So he does not regret, he does not have any apology to give to anybody. Yes. First point. The second point is that I've had the opportunity now. Even his office gave me appointment. It's the delegate to go and meet him. Appointment fixed for 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. By 7 p.m., we were still there. And he even left through the back door mm -hmm. to go away. Please, this is a living witness that we can justify and put in the public. That's part of unnecessary arrogance. The third point is that the National Assembly, please, is the Terra cognita of the people's mandate, people's power, delegated authority. So when the Senate is talking, we know the Senate represents states. The House re represents the, the, the people. Now, you have these people asking you to come. Are you not saying that you are superior to the people of Nigeria represented in the National Assembly. We have to be careful. Now, another fourth point. We have to be careful. There's no, there no care there. It's hard facts. Please, the National Assembly, when I say terra cognita, I mean a, a, a place, the land well known, all right? The depository of the powers of the people. The people. Yeah. All right? Well, I have, so, I have. Now, the fourth point think? there, please, yes. in protocol, mm. official protocol, particularly in diplomacy. 
People sit according to their ranks. Ambassadors have categorizations. Um, public officials have their levels. Mm -hmm. It's just like water, which must always find its own level. Mm -hmm. So in this case, at the end of the day, the office of the IGP is not at the same level with the office of the president of the Senate. The Senate president is number three citizens in this country. of this country. Well, so, I, I so, think the uh, issue is not even about ranking. It's not even about ego. You know, it's about the public interest. Exactly. Yeah, okay, and I think we'll be uh, very safe if we stay with what is in the public, public interest. interest. However, the Inspector General of Police has alleged that he's a victim of a witch hunt orchestrated by the Senate. And then, of course, there's been a lot of personalization of it. Said the same thing, yeah. You know, in, 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 in the last few days, for example, uh, the IGP has shown up on social media as a man who cannot even deliver a coherent speech. <laughs> and questions have been raised about his competence, you know, his intellectual capacity, his mental capacity. And his handlers are saying, oh, this is part of the, uh, of the, of the quarrel uh, with the Senate. What do you think? Is he a victim of a witch hunt or he should be more committed to public interest? Terrible. Well, uh, how you define public interest has to be subject you know, to the, the provisions of the laws under which we operate. <laughs> Nigeria is not a parliamentary democracy in which ministers are members of parliament. No, before and, you and go for no, 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 let, don't, let don't go too far. Let me land. No, 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 let no, me no, land. no, don't go too far to, to save time. Uh -huh. The Americans, you know, whose system we copy, they run a presidential system. Yeah. Let's let me summon, finish. They summon let public me, officials to Congress. Yeah. Can I come finish? and address Congress. Can I so can please, we, don't waste time. One. We saw Max I'm not wasting time. We saw Max Zuckerberg mm. getting to, a few weeks ago. You see, under a presidential system, mm. there are separation of powers. The Senate cannot be ordering executive frivolously. They are appointees of the Nigerians president. Nigerians are dying. What's finish? frivolous about that, please, Mr. Terry? They are appointees of the president, and they report to the president, not to the National Assembly. National Assembly can hold the president responsible, you know, for the actions of his agents. They are agents of the, They are not ministers in the manner of the so U.S. where they are members when, of parliament. When, when and therefore report to Excuse me. So, excuse the point, the point when, when I'm making, Congress, can I Just wait. Yes. When Congress summons the head of the FBI, mm. or summons the head of the Department of Justice. Mm. Yes. Okay? Right. So, should they have summoned the president? For hearing. No, on, sometimes on to come an and investigation explain, and to come and explain specific, specific issues. Yeah. To come and explain specific issues. And we're not, and we're not being told that this is what is happening. Mr. Terry, but no. please, let's stick to the facts. He was no. invited to address incessant killings in Nigeria. Terry. You don't have to shout. Please. No, but let's make the uh -huh. point. And you made the point yes. that he could choose whether the head of a, the most relevant department should go and attend to them, or if he has to go personally. That was why I was so talking about still protocol. Time. Exactly. Yeah. Still every time. Every time. That he should was. come personally. That was why. 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 This is why I was time. talking about protocol, mm. that look, uh, the level of uh, the Senate president warrants that the head of, of the agency. police force yes. should be there. There's nothing because about the level, hold there's on. separation of powers. It's not a question of separation of powers. He's not, not a member of the legislature. It's not like it's that. It's not a question of seniority of okay. the okay. 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 No, you are saying Just a moment. He reports to the president. Just a moment. No, Mr. Not, Teriba, uh, the president is number one. Please calm down, Teriba. OK, if we go with your logic, mm -hmm. does the uh, National Assembly, does it also have the right, for example, to summon maybe a minister? or the head of a ministry or department or agency? He could summon whoever he wills. But you've seen ministers, you've seen the head of the custom refuse to answer to the summon. And he got away with it. It's because his customers are becoming the, frivolous. It's also a discipline in the public service. You can summon it's, whoever, it's but that person is also judge whether the summon makes sense or does not make sense. And therefore, whether they want to honor it or not. Well, no. I think, I think what, Mr. no, let's Abate, calm down, before you, let's calm Before down. you round up, no, no, I'm, I'm quite calm, actually. Before you round up, but I, I, I just will not, for the record, sit and allow Mr. Teriba 
to couch the invitation by the Senate to the Inspector General of Police to talk about Nigerians dying across the country and what the police force, which is responsible for the protection, for the protection of, of the same people, to do about it. Calling that a frivolous summons for me is completely unacceptable. You are misrepresenting That's what, what I said. said. That's what you said. Let me tell you what I call frivolous. Insisting on every occasion that the IG should appear personally is frivolous. If you want a police to give you information, it is issue. the discretion of the IG to decide who, which member of the police force is going to represent them. No, not every that's... time IG should come. No. That's Mr. Mariba, my point. We're not talking about every issue. We're talking about this particular issue, and which is why I keep insisting. There is on no this. particular there issue. Is we, have, particular we have cited okay, more than okay. one example. I, I no, think that this is, this is really. Uh, uh, you we know, give him more than one example. Really so you, you, you keep subject. narrowing down to one. Okay, we'll probably, we'll probably come back to it some other time. Uh, I see this is probably a reflection of what is out there in Nigeria. It's controversy. Yeah, the controversy. It's all right. Between Unless people, between people yeah. who are passionate about the executive doing what it likes and people who are very passionate about the uh, legislature also, doing what it likes. also intervening. <laughs> it's time now for a short break here on This Day Life, the Sunday talk show. When we return, we'll be discussing the relocation of embassies to Jerusalem. Don't go away. Welcome back to This Day Live, the Sunday talk show here on the RIS News Channel. Well, don't worry. Sometimes these, uh, you know, discussions get really, really animated. Let's uh, talk about uh, Israel, Jerusalem, and the embassies. The United States received intense international criticism on Monday when it celebrated the opening of its embassy in Jerusalem. It was the first country to make the provocative move, provocative in quotes, uh, to Tel Aviv. But on Wednesday, Guatemala joined the U.S. in moving its embassy to Jerusalem. More countries are preparing to make the same move. Paraguay's foreign ministry announced that its embassy will also relocate to Jerusalem, while the Czech Republic, Romania, and Honduras are reportedly also considering the move. Prof, this is your uh, territory, and I think you've done an essay on this. Now, what does it mean in real terms? Because the way Nigerians react to the argument. I've seen a lot of Pentecostal, evangelical, mm -hmm. you know, response that this is uh, a fulfillment of the, the biblical prophecy. prophecy and all that, you know. But I don't think the big issue is spirituality. There are practical dimensions. What do you think? First of all, I think that the United States and all the other countries that are following it are unnecessarily breaching, you know, the spirit of international law. Um, it's now a conflict between the laws in, of the United States, Guatemala, Honduras, and also vis-a-vis uh, -vis international law. You see, Jerusalem is supposed to be a sort of condominium. Uh, it's a city over which the United Nations is supposed to administer. Um, United Nations General Assembly Resolution 181 makes Jerusalem an international city over which Neither Israel nor the Palestinians, the Arabs, have sovereignty. All right. So, um, United States was also signatory, all right, was quite privy to the adoption of the resolution. Now, because the United States uh, adopted in 1995 uh, what they call the um, Jerusalem um, Embassy Act, all right, which required the U.S. to relocate by May 1999. And um, Donald Trump happens to be the first president now to weave it 
and establish. Uh, it is a direct negation hmm. of the principles of international law. Now, sanctity of agreements, or what is normally called Pacta Sunt Servanda, hmm. this is what uh, the Americans are now telling the world that, look, you can sign an agreement, but you can also breach it. Yeah, so the Pentecontal, uh, yeah, okay. the, the Pentecontalist uh, dimension, people easily forget that Jerusalem, all right, of yesterday is quite different from Jerusalem of today. Of today. Resolution 181 provides for a new Jerusalem, all right? It's not, the existing Jerusalem is Western and Eastern Jerusalem, all right? Eastern Jerusalem was given, uh, was covered from Jordan. 1948, after the, the war. Now, following the Six Day War in 67. The Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is 1973. And in this case, uh, Israel came up with an act, with a law in 1980. Now, acquiring, taking effective occupation of both the Eastern and the Western. So this is the problem. The Bible provides for people of Israel, all right? is quite different from territory. The state of Israel was created in 1950, uh, 1948, May 14, all right? With uh, the acquisition of uh, territory, people, and um, government. Well, Prof, you've given a very comprehensive uh, overview, but just before we leave this subject, uh, Yemi, uh, what's your thought? <coughs> well, I, I'd... I think, it, how do I phrase this? The discordance between sort of international treaties, um, religious beliefs, and the politics, and the intersection of the three things, as Prof has highlighted, for me, just makes for interesting conversation. Because depending on who you're speaking to and from which um, lens they're looking at it at, that's how they see okay, what's uh, happening. Okay, Mr. Tereba, very quickly also. Uh, yeah. Um, what is this all about? And what's the implication for the Middle East peace process? Because well, that's important. This is uh, American unilateralism. I feel like Trump's unilateralism at stake. When he declared that he was going to move his uh, embassy uh, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, the UN voted and declared you know, the declaration null and void. Yes. So he has gone on to do it in spite of the exactly. UN saying no. Resolution. So how far is unilateralism will take the world remains to be seen. Well, he has you. done the same thing on Iran. He has done the same thing on the climate change. On, on the climate change so how far he could travel, you know, doing things alone remains to be seen. Well, thank you very much. I mean, although we must also know that uh, Trump doesn't see it as a unilateralism. He sees it as a American exceptionalism. But that's another I subject that first. Uh, entirely. <laughs> it's time now for another break here on This Day Live, the Sunday talk show. When we return, we'll be discussing the very important subject of the royal wedding. Don't go away. Welcome back to This Day Live, the Sunday talk show here on the Arise News Channel. Now, American actress Meghan Markle, now the Duchess of Sussex was walked down the aisle of the 15th century chapel in Windsor Castle in front of 600 guests, including members of the royal family and friends, where she tied the knot with Prince Harry in a dazzling display of British pomp and pageantry. A further 1,200 people invited by the royal couple gathered inside the castle, on the grounds of the castle also, to see the bride and groom on their wedding day. American actress Meghan Merkel who shot to fame on legal drama, Suits, married the sixth in line to the British throne. The couple are now known as the Duke and Duchess of Success. Nothing captured the transatlantic nature of Saturday's real wedding as much as a guest preacher whose sermon brought American fire and flair to a very English church service. The bishop's passionate sermon on the theme of love started with quotes from the Bible, Martin Luther King Jr., an African-American spirituality, was a contrast to the more solemn Anglican style the royal family 
is used to. A great event, all the same. A lot of excitement here in Nigeria. But joining us uh, now on the program in this segment is Dan Warren, uh, a Rice TV correspondent based in London, now with us in Lagos. Dan, what do you make of this big event, historic well, event that I, occurred I, yesterday? I think yesterday sort of marked the, the, the next generation of how the royal family uh, want to want to be seen because obviously for for the last um, uh, 50 odd years we've seen um, Queen Elizabeth um, be very traditional with with what uh, the, the royals are expected to do and in in the last year or so we've seen her um, take a, a step down to a lot of her her duty um, her husband has retired from public life Prince Charles and uh, Prince William are substituting her to do her daily activities and um, so there's always been talk of modernizing the royal family but the debate is how do you mo modernize them and I think yesterday clearly showed the fact that uh, the, the, the guest list, the people that were there, it was a who's who of Hollywood and sporting stars. Normally it looks more like a, a UN type event. I, I remember Prince William was saying that when it was his wedding and he looked at the guest list originally, it was like, I don't know any of these people. And it was heads of state from Commonwealth nations um, and uh, people that, that they they don't have any rapport with. And, and this time, uh, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle said to the Queen, we want to do things our own way. It was slightly controversial not to invite any politicians, I think, especially uh, the, the British Prime Minister, mm -hmm. Theresa May. But, you know, they, they've, they've put that rule. No one was an exception, so, so Theresa May had to stay at home. And I think what we saw was just a... Um, a complete diverse service, and I think that's what the, the UK stands for these days, is diversity. Yeah. Good point. I mean, uh, but let, me, let me come to you about the symbolism of that event. You talk about change, about modernization, about, you know, a monarchy that is ready to respond to new trends. But for many Nigerians, the, there's issue about the symbolism of it. The, the, the priest from the United States, uh, Bishop uh, Michael Curry, and then that, uh, that choir, mm -hmm. you know, that sang, Stand By Me, yeah. all black. I mean, uh, you know, really, really, uh, strange, you know, that you have almost an all-black cast, you mm -hmm. know, taking charge of the high moments of the event. What do you think? One of the interesting tweets I saw yesterday said, um, Harry's, the royal wedding was more black than the Oscars. I'm sure, you know, the, the comedy around the Oscars being um, too, too white. But I think what I find fascinating is that when people talk about modernizing the royal family, it's as if the royal family set out for this to happen. They didn't choose who Harry happened to fall in love with. Mm -hmm. It just sort of happened. So then it's in Harry falling in love, and Harry has been quite unconventional throughout throughout his life, really. Um, so it's in Harry's choice of a of a wife that then provided the opportunity for the royal family to be open up to to other things, which I think for me is, is the more fascinating part of it. Yeah, so but the queen could have refused, you know, which well, is why I think the point you made is well, important. I, to be honest, After all, the crown refused to allow King Edward VIII but uh, to, past, to marry Wallace no, Simpson. But to be quite honest, Prince Charles is now married. Prince Charles's issue has, has, for me, set the tone for what the queen yes. would refuse to do anymore. So I think that has really passed. Well, the, quickly, before we go, anyway. Prof, and briefly, <laughs> because we're running out of time. Um, you are, the, you are the expert in protocol matters. Mm. Now, watching that yesterday, all those important people there, they didn't have bodyguards. <laughs> Nobody was opening doors for anybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, if that wedding had been in Nigeria, what do you imagine would have happened? Mm -hmm. Even the AIDS would not have allowed anybody to, 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 to function. The issue is that the tables are all numbered already. People who are to enter, <laughs> they have already indicated where to sit, where to go through the passage. All those things are done. But in our own case, we are not used to that. And at the end of the day, people who are not invited will want to join and uh, get crashed and all those things. So that's why. But in any case, I think it's quite um, interesting from two points. Point one is that, look, they preach to us that uh, our monarchical system is not good, but they are protecting their own over there. Well, and we can now see the beauty. Well, so and much. the black factor I, is very good, which shows that Britain is now a uh, well exposed to all these... Uh, so much about uh, diversity, uh, so much yeah, about yeah, so. grace, simplicity, class, culture, New and many for, lessons that Nigerians and other people can learn yeah, from that great event that we had yesterday and probably uh, 
Prince Harry and uh, Meghan Markle may probably end up as a man and woman of the year with the symbolism of that uh, marriage. Mm -hmm. Congratulations uh, to both of them from This Day Live. You've been watching This Day Live, the Sunday talk show here on Arise News. I'm Ruben Abati. For my entire team here in Lagos, it's bye for now, and thank you very much for watching. Mm -hmm.